nice little event here. We're going to talk about what we can be doing here in Yonkers to keep our community safe, to make sure that we're doing a better job of building the fabric and the tapestry that makes a community what it is. Uh, violence affects all of us. Um, it affects every single family. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic background. We know that there are disparities um, by race and socioeconomic backgrounds, but the work that it requires to make sure that the violence in and of itself can be decreased um, knows no need. And so, you know, I think it's important for us to be able to be here as a community, united, to say, we know that the things that are happening to us don't have to happen. We know that there are families that have holes that can never be repaired. And the notion that we don't hold people in government responsible, that we don't hold their feet to the fire, that we don't ask of them to pass simple legislation, to put together these simple plans that we know can help keep our community safe, to help keep our children safe, to help keep spouses in trouble safe. Um, and so again, violence comes in so many different forms. We've got illegal gun violence, we've got domestic violence, we've got violence against women. You know, just today we found out another, uh, more atrocities, thousands of children in Pennsylvania um, who have been victimized, unfortunately, by, by members of the clergy. So these issues are pervasive in society. And so, you know, that's why I wanted to get together, obviously one, to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, but also to talk about this issue um, that to me is at the center of everything. Um, for those that don't know, I'm Joe Pinion, a uh, lifelong resident here in Yonkers. Uh, of course, because of this lovely woman who decided to move to Yonkers in 1979. Uh, your sister? But, That's your sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but again, it was that decision that she made to say that I wanted to have a place that could provide a foundation a place that was in a community where I can raise a child, where I can have the security to know that the opportunities that he deserves, the opportunities that she did not have, would be possible. And so Yonkers is ground zero for all of that. It provides the framework that allows me to stand here before you and say I'm ready to go to Albany and fight for the resources that our city deserves. To stand up and say that I will be your voice. You know, we, we so often we get mired in, in this political political conundrums, you know, where people people get caught up in partisan bickering, tribalism is on the rise, you know. But the one thing that I love about Yonkers and the one thing that I love about this seat is that this isn't about politics. It's just about standing up and saying that Yonkers deserves better, that we deserve more. Uh, you know, I've I've had the opportunity, some of you know I've been able to go on national television. I've been able to talk about issues when you're talking about criminal justice reform, when you're talking about, you know, what should we be doing to make sure that children are getting equal access, you know. So I've had an opportunity to be a voice in many places, you know, I've, and like I said, I've had the opportunity to speak truth to power. You know, I, you know, it's no secret that I'm, I am a Republican, you know, sometimes I guess that's a dirty word these days, but I, you know, I think that to me, I think I've demonstrated a willingness to speak truth to power a willingness to say that these are the things that I care about, but these are also things that are not partisan, right? When you start talking about equality, equality is not a partisan issue, it's a moral one. When you start talking about, again, families who are affected by violence, solving that is not a partisan issue, it's a moral imperative. And so I just wanted to have the opportunity to get here and start having that conversation um, with all of you. Obviously, we have our distinguished councilmen, I want to thank them for coming. Obviously, we have Councilman John Rubo. Um, <laughs> Councilman Moranti, who's here as well. <laughs> and last but not least, certainly the minority leader himself, Mike. <laughs> but over here with the young Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, I think a lot of people, the first question they want to ask you is, why did you run? Um, and I think that it's, it's an important question. Uh, it's two, two quick stories. I was, uh, I was talking to my friend, uh, friend, my name is my friend Nate. 
he often has these great conversations, you know. He turned to me one day, I think we were out in the city, and he says, Joe, are you happy? And, you know, it's one of those ridiculous questions that guys aren't supposed to ask other guys. And so I think, again, I was so stunned that I told the truth. I said, I wasn't happy. And he said, Joe, well, why aren't you happy? You know, you get to go on CNN and talk about politics. You get to speak on panels around the country about the importance of, you know, making sure that we have racial equality and what we can do to make sure that we have harmony um, in our communities. And I said, look, the reality was I looked around and said, I don't know how to be happy when the places I call home has got 24% of our children living in poverty. I don't know how to be happy when 78% of the children that attend our public schools can't afford lunch. I don't know how to be happy when you've got gone from 4,000 kids in after school sports down to just 800. Kids that should have the same opportunities that I had got the opportunity to go to college and play, and play Division I athletics. There are kids that are much more talented than I ever will be being deprived of those opportunities because we don't have the resources that we deserve. And so I made a decision that I would begin looking into this process of running. Um, fast forward, the mail came. Got, you know, we always get these, these quarterly newsletters from our representatives. So I got the quarterly newsletter from the person who previously held this seat. And the quarterly newsletter, I think it was page two, bottom paragraph, said that they were disappointed with the rate hike for Con Edison, and that because of that disappointment, they had written a letter to Con Edison. And so it was at that point that I said that things have gotten too bad. We've got every year budget crises here in, here in Yonkers, and those local budget crises are in many ways a result of the problems that we have at the state level. We're not getting the funding that we deserve. We pay more in taxes here in Yonkers than Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo combined. The second, third, the, or I said the second, third, and fifth largest cities, we as the fourth largest city pay more than all of them. It makes no sense. And what do we have to show for it? We've got kids in 150 year old school buildings trying to learn algebra and decommissioning lock locker rooms with holes in them. That's, that's not hyperbole. That's actually what's happening here in Yonkers. And so when you look at that and say, how is that possible? When you look at a casino, Empire Casino, that puts more money in the coffers for New York State than Mega Millions and Powerball combined. And yet, we're 19th on the list of direct lottery payments as a city, even though we, have, we host Empire Casino, which again, has more resources coming out of that place than six of the eight racinos in the entire state combined. Why are we getting the pittance of that? Why is the state getting 80% of those resources and we're getting 5%? The answer is simple, because the people we entrusted to protect us signed off on the deal. I don't have personal animus, but I do have public concerns. And the reality for us as a city is that we must begin to have the honest conversations. The conversations about why do these things keep happening to us? Why are we every year talking about quality of life apocalypses? Where you're going to lay off 250 school personnel. Where you're going to send 78 police officers packing. In a city that needs more police officers now than ever. In a city where we have elected officials who, out of the left side of their mouth, at the state level, they're talking about ending child bullying. Out of the right side of their mouth, they're cutting the funding we need for bus monitors. It doesn't make any sense. And so I wanted to begin to have that conversation. There are many issues. We're going to be having plenty of town halls. We're going to talk about health care. Because Lord knows that we have inadequate health care systems in this state. We're going to talk about prescription drugs. We're going to talk about our schools, we're going to talk about our seniors. What can we do to make sure that our seniors, the people who have paid the price, the people who have paved the road for us, can stay in the communities that they, they call home? We're going to have all those conversations. But today, we're going to talk about gun violence. We're going to talk about domestic violence. We're going to talk about how we can end street violence in our community. Um, so one of the first things I want to talk about, again, are illegal guns. Um, so I think, obviously, many people know the story, the Nolan family story. Um, their plight, but I don't, I don't think there's anyone who can tell that story uh, better than they can. Um, so I just wanted to give them a, free, a moment to tell their story and then pivot from there to talk about what we can do at the state level from a government standpoint to make sure the tragedies that have befallen their family don't befall anybody else. So, I, I, I'm like Nolan's dad. All right? He got my high, that's my wife Donna, that's where he got the talent from, and that's my older son Jim runs the Michael Nolan Scholarship Fund. But I'm gonna let you guys know, uh, Joe, you got tools, okay? 
we ran into, what's going on? It's going to be two years. My son's dead. I still cry. All right? um, I always told my, uh, my kids, it's always a way to do something. I don't want to hear you can't do it. You can do it. And I told my son, Michael, that's what you want to do. Pitch at Yankee Stadium. Chase your dream. And that kid did. That kid could have built a building. But um, me and my wife have been talking to a lot of politicians over the years. All right. We got a few things done, like the drag racing law. And uh, we got a problem with uh, unlegal guns. We have mass shootings every weekend. Three, four, five, 20 people getting shot, Scarborough. 70 people getting shot a weekend. It, it has to stop. Nobody wants to talk about illegal guns. We talked to a lot of politicians. We sat down with Joe. I figured the thing will go on for, but maybe for about a half hour at Yonkers Raceway, right, Joe? Went on for two and a half hours, almost three hours. Me and my wife walked out of there and said, wow, not dumbfounded what other politicians, he did not dance around us. And my house, all right, this is things I put together over the years, but my wife knows numbers more than I do. All right, this is pictures of Michael. Michael was the heart of my family. They took a knife, cut my heart out, all right? These are just gun runs, gun runs from Highway 95. All right, articles, there's about, look at the pile of guns, illegal guns they take off the street. Cops are doing their jobs. The judges are not doing their jobs. And the DAs, wheeling and dealing. Then after when your kid is murdered, you gotta sit down and wheel and deal? Who murdered my kid? You know, these are just pictures of us on the beach. Let me tell you, my house, my house, the walls, I used to, in my room watching TV or living room, my kids laughing, laughing. Michael was the heart of my family. And that was her best friend. And what I have in my house now is tears. It's not like getting up at 2, 3 in the morning crying. All right? Listening to your kids crying through those walls because of people not doing their jobs. All right? We're not against guns. We're against the the thugs who has them. And it has to stop. Don't ever say this will never happen to your family. I've done this like a hundred times before and I know mostly everybody in this room. Um, I'll say it again. The city of Yonkers was probably the biggest supporter of my family. Um, just friends. I, I, you all know what I'm talking about, Jay, and I can never say thank you enough, but I think my biggest problem is we have an illegal gun issue out there. It happens every single day, and nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear about it. All I hear is, well, what are we gonna do? What can we do? Well, there's a lot of things we can do. We have the toughest three and a half years for an illegal gun in New York State signed by the governor, and there's nobody. They'll go to jail for a gun. We talked about it, Joe, but they go to jail because of the gun, but because they used it, not simply because they had it. It shouldn't matter what color you are, what religion you are, does it, none of that should even come into it. If you're walking around and you have an illegal gun, you're gonna use it. You're either gonna use it to intimidate someone, rob someone, or take someone's life. It's not a piece of jewelry. But unless we step up to the plate and start talking about the illegal gun issue that we have, and I'm not trying to minimize the mass shootings in the schools or nothing like that because my heart goes out to those families, but there's also every single day an innocent person, young person, is losing their lives to illegal guns. And we need to talk about it. This is the first man that I've talked to that's actually understood where I was coming from, what I was saying, and said, I have an idea. We can do it. Is it gonna work? Maybe, but we won't know unless it's done. Something has to be done. We cannot just keep letting all these young people lose their lives, and the ones that are doing it. I mean, they know the laws and, and better than we do. 